Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. For the half of you that were up till 1.45 last night watching the baseball game, thank you for making it here, and I, I hope we have an invigorating discussion that keeps you awake for the rest of the evening. Uh, for those who have spent all day reading legal briefs and indictments, I hope this <laughs> affords some, uh, uh, some enter entertainment as well as some enlightenment. Um, I wanted to begin the evening with a quote. Somebody told me that whenever you begin an event, you either begin with a quote or you begin with a joke. So I'm going to go with a quote. So the quote, I want to make sure I get it right. So I got it on my phone here. Excuse me while I bring the phone out. And the quote is this. Um, Winston Churchill is reported to have said that a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. Well, that actually isn't true. Winston Churchill actually never said that. But if you go on the internet, <laughs> the internet will tell you almost universally that Winston Churchill said that. So I, I thought to myself, well, I want to find out who really said it. It's a great quote. So I did a little digging, and lo and behold, Mark Twain. It was a Mark Twain quote from 1913. Problem is, Mark Twain died in 1910. <laughs> So it wasn't Mark Twain. So I did a little more digging, a little more digging, and it turns out there was a Reverend Sturgeon, some fiery New England minister, and he had a, a series of statements that were referred to as Sturgeon's Gems, and this was one of Sturgeon's Gems. Well, except it turns out that he actually stole it from another minister who published a sermon back in the mid-1700s. And there are some scholars who say, that the quote actually goes back in some forms to Oliver Swift, at least in the English language. There may be Chinese proverbs that cover the same territory. So, truth is an interesting thing. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, and that's what's going to be the theme that's going to govern this new Hayden Center over the coming year. Uh, the Hayden Center, uh, or its full name, the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence, Policy, and International Security, We've had no luck fitting that on a t-shirt. <laughs> so we are just, for shorthand, calling it the Hayden Center. Uh, the Hayden Center stood up this month. Uh, we're very happy uh, to uh, have it up and running at the George Mason University's Shar School of Policy and Government. Um, we've got a great program for you tonight. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with some introductory comments about the center. Uh, and those will be presented by both the Dean of the Shar School as well as General Hayden. Uh, and then General Hayden will uh, move into the topic for discussion tonight, which as many of you have seen on the program or in the advertisements, is truth tellers in the bunker, uh, evidence-based institutions in a post-truth world. Um, some administrative comments. Uh, phones, I know almost all of you have phones. I'm not going to tell you to turn them off, but I would love it if you put them on vibrate so we don't have the rings distracting us while we're talking. Uh, I would also love it if, for those of you who feel inclined, if you want to tweet about the event, that's fantastic. Um, if you want to tweet, I would ask you to use either the hashtag in the bunker or use our handle, which is the at sign MV Hayden Center. I'll, I'll run together. Uh, that would be fantastic. I would really appreciate that. The uh, program tonight includes the panel discussion moderated by General Hayden. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers with him. I think uh, uh, you're, you're familiar with all of them, so I won't go into lengthy introductions for them. But we have uh, uh, retired General James Clapper, former DNI, uh, Director of National Intelligence, for those uh, who aren't aware of the alphabet. Uh, we have um, Jack Goldsmith, former Assistant Attorney General uh, for the Office of Legal Counsel and current Harvard Law School professor. Uh, we were talking earlier, Harvard Law School celebrated its 200th anniversary uh, just this last week, so quite a milestone for them. Uh, we also have Nicole Wallace, who just rushed over here from her television show that she was gracious enough to broadcast from Washington, D.C. instead of New York City tonight uh, in order to be here. So uh, appreciate Nicole being here as well. Uh, Nicole, uh, besides being the NBC News uh, luminary she is, uh, also served as communications director in the White House during uh, the Bush years. Uh, and then lastly, we have Dean uh, Mark Rosell, uh, who uh, is, is serving on the panel, but whom I would like to introduce here uh, t 
to come up and uh, make some introductory comments and then to introduce General Hayden. Uh, for those who don't know Mark Rosell, uh, Mark is the founding dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government. Uh, he has been the uh, dean of the school in either an acting or, or full capacity since 2013. Uh, he has been at George Mason University since 2004. And before that, he spent 10 years at Catholic University, and uh, before that, had time at uh, some other universities as well. Uh, he is the author of uh, nine books and the uh, editor of 20 others. Uh, some of the most recent books that he has written have uh, touched on religion and politics. Uh, for a good Catholic like me, I've got to have to read his recent uh, edited book about Catholics uh, in the U.S. and politics uh, since 2016. Uh, but he's also written about the uh, uh, and edited books about the religious right. Uh, he is featured uh, prominently in the editorial pages of most major publications uh, and scholarly journals. Uh, and uh, if anyone's reading the news in recent days, he's been f uh, figured prominently in discussions about the uh, uh, Virginia gubernatorial election. That for those of you from Virginia, we hope you go out and vote uh, in the next week or so. Um, Mark has also spoken uh, around the world uh, and uh, has appeared on uh, major networks and major television shows uh, across the uh, cable spectrum. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean Rizzo. Great. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I want to give a welcome to all of you uh, to this wonderful event that is being hosted by the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Uh, I'm delighted that you're here. I'm delighted to in a moment introduce uh, Mike Hayden, the director of our new Hayden Center. Uh, Larry, by the way, is the director of the Hayden Center. Uh, he's worked in the past with General Hayden uh, as his chief of staff at the CIA. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we have a number of important people here today, VIPs as we say, uh, members of General Hayden's family, friends, donors, alums, friends of the school, uh, members of our faculty, our two associate deans, uh, local officials, business people. Anyway, you're all important. Uh, so thank you for being here. But in particular, I'd like to uh, recognize the rector of the university, Tom Davis. Thank you, Tom. And also, <laughs> and the provost of George Mason University, David Wu. David, thank you. So uh, we're delighted to have the Hayden Center at George Mason University. Um, and as you know, threats to global security have rarely been so great in scope and number. Uh, in a very complex, complicated world, intelligence has never been more vital. And the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security provides a full examination of intelligence and its interplay in US national security. Uh, very fortunately, at our Arlington campus, uh, just four miles from the White House and six miles from the CIA headquarters. So we're very well located to uh, be doing what we'll be doing in the Hayden Center. Uh, the Hayden Center is to examine broad issues of policy, intelligence, and security, as well as a number of topical and timely concerns of the day, providing recommendations and solutions to uh, decision makers and opinion leaders throughout the country. So I would like to introduce uh, my friend, my colleague, uh, General Mike Hayden, uh, founder of the Hayden Center, most importantly, but also a retired four-star general, and he's the only person to have served as director of both the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency, as well as serving as the nation's first principal deputy director of national intelligence and the highest ranking military officer, intelligence officer in the country. Uh, so I can't tell you how pleased I am, Mike, that you joined the Shar School. Uh, what is now the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. In 2009, Mike has been teaching regularly for us for the past seven years. And I like to tell the story that every time his course goes up online within five minutes, it's completely full and there's a long wait list. So I think you will find out tonight why that's the case. So Mike, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thank, thank you very much. That the fill up online thing is because they think I'm going to slip and tell secrets, and so they want to come in. So um, Mark and Larry have given you a broad uh, brush approach to what we attempt to do at the Hayden Center, frankly, a, a space in, in which we can, in a non-accusatory way, 
talk about the things that are important to American espionage. What I tell my classes is rarely is something so essential to American safety and liberty been so missed or ununderstood by the population that it serves. And so that, that's the purpose uh, of uh, the center itself. Tonight, tonight we took, we took as the, the theme for, for, for the first year this, this truth tellers in the bunker. Um, 2016, Oxford Dictionary's word of the year, post-truth. Okay? Action based upon preference, feeling, or emotion, rather than a view of objective reality. And I think there's a reason. It became the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year uh, this past year. Uh, I'm fond of saying that the current administration's high friction points, if you look back over the last eight or nine months, the high friction points have been with intelligence, Law enforcement and the judiciary, scholarship, science, and journalism. And, and what do they all have in common? In an imperfect way, they do their best to conduct their business based on evidence. They're all evidence-based institutions, and now we have high friction points. By the way, in my little hand puppet up here, I need to point out that, that the thumb, that's the intelligence guys, has not often been clasped together with the other four, all right? <laughs> and in, in fact, a good part of my professional life has consisted of <clears throat> these four kind of feeling free to criticize this one for how we gather our data. The last two or three years, no one has come to me, despite a whole bunch of controversial programs in our history, to argue about how we gather data. All they recognize now is we, like them, are data people, and we have pulled together. And it's been a, a remarkable thing for me. Just I didn't create. I, I, I just observed. That's what my life experience has been about. So what we've got are representatives uh, from these institutions here tonight. So let me just invite them on up here, and we'll right, jump right into the conversation. So Director of National Intelligence, uh, Jim Clapper. You've got the background on Jim besides all that stuff. Besides all that stuff, Jim has been a mentor to me for most of my military career. Okay. Uh, Nicole Wallace, introduced already from NBC News. <laughs> Nicole and I were actually in the 43 administration where she was director of communications. Uh, Jack Goldsmith, former head of the Office of Legal Counsel. <clears throat> As, as director of NSA and CIA, when Jack became the head of OLC, he overturned a whole bunch of legal opinions on which I was depending, <laughs> and thereby put the programs on a much more solid legal footing to allow them to be handed off, not just to 43-2, but to President 44 as well. And then you already have met uh, Dean Mark Roselle, who's been a wonderful supporter for our effort. Okay. Enough of the preliminaries. Jim, I'm going to start with you. So when I, when I talk about intelligence, I, I, I kind of do this yin and yang. We're fact-based people, the policymakers' vision, fact, vision, world as it is, world as we want it to be. We're inherently inductive. We work from data. They're inherently deductive, first principles. How do we apply? You and I are inherently pessimistic. They want to be optimistic. You know, fact, vision, as is, want to be inductive, deductive, pessimistic optimistic. So there's always tension between you and the Oval and the President, between me and the Oval uh, and the President. I think we all knew that with a President Trump, all right, this is going to be a, a bigger speed bump than normal because <laughs> all those things over here on the left, he seemed to have gotten extra doses of from the Creator. And I point out that it's a, uh, a great American tragedy that when we first had to try to close that gap, all right, which would always exists, but in this case, in a little more strength. When we had to close that gap, uh, we had to do it on an issue that a lot of other Americans, not you, were using to challenge his legitimacy as President of the United States. You took that message into him January 6th. How'd that go? Well, it was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, uh, a couple comments before I uh, answer Mike's question is, uh, 
It's a real honor for me to be a participant in this uh, event and uh, help kick off uh, publicly the Mike uh, Hayden Center. Uh, as a longtime friend, colleague, and admirer of Mike Hayden, I, I can't uh, think of a better namesake and at a, a better time. I also think it's very appropriate in this venue in the National Press Club that we have a discussion about, uh, about truth. So there is, uh, <clears throat> at least as I spent my 50 years or so in intelligence, uh, kind of a fundamental tenet about uh, always telling truth to power, meaning you don't politicize, you don't taint, you don't slant, um, you don't uh, present something uh, or selectively present something because you think that's what your policymaker boss, whoever that is, whether it's policymaker number one or military officer, it doesn't matter, what, they, what you think they might want to hear. And the objective is uh, to try to be as objective and unvarnished uh, as you possibly can. So the hallmark is uh, a truth to power, but I can't resist the opportunity for commercial. I'm, I'm writing a book now that will <laughs> in, in some way have that phrase in it in the, in the book title. So watch this space. Um, that's not to say that uh, having served uh, President Obama six and a half years that, uh, you know, didn't have some rough time uh, with, uh, with him and uh, with, uh, you know, his uh, advisors in, uh, in the White House. Uh, John Brennan, uh, another close personal friend, and I uh, used to refer to ourselves as foxhole buddies uh, in, in the endless hours in the sit room where sometimes he and I were two voices uh, apart from everybody else. And, of course, one of the first things you learn in Intel school the first week, there's only two conditions in life. There's policy success or intel failure. There's no <laughs> other condition than one. Anyway, um, so all of this uh, kind of, for me, sort of got you know, put to the test a bit uh, as we transition from um, uh, President Obama to uh, now President Trump. And what brought this, uh, of course, to a head was the uh, uh, intelligence community assessment that um, Three of the agencies, I need to make that clear, it wasn't all the, the, the entire IC, just the CIA, FBI, and NSA under the auspices of my office. Uh, President Obama charged us with uh, putting together everything we could, and he, this, this tasking was in the first week of December, and he wanted this done um, before the end of his administration. And <clears throat> his two purposes were to uh, put as much as we could together in one report and uh, uh, for something he could hand off to the next administration to the Congress. And then he also directed us to do as best we could to uh, also have a publicly rele releasable or unclassified version of the same intelligence community assessment. And we did that. The, intelligence co the key judgments for both versions are identical. There are no difference in the... Uh, uh, in the, the key judgments that we reached, the, the, the difference, of course, is that we could not be uh, as explicit in the substantiation, the evidentiary base for this, which some people found very frustrating. Um, but our judgment was that we were not going to give away uh, accesses and capabilities and tradecraft that we've literally spent, you have spent, invested uh, literally billions of dollars to to gain, so we didn't want to compromise that for the sake of making everybody feel good. So uh, as the sequence of events unfolded, uh, we uh, briefed the Gang of Eight uh, the morning of the Friday the 6th of January and then uh, ran out to Andrews and flew up to New York <coughs> and for what will, I'm sure, undoubtedly be my first and last ever sojourn to Trump Tower. <laughs> and. Uh, briefed uh, the president-elect, and uh, it was then that I uh, had an awakening that, uh, you know, there's a, maybe a different rule set here uh, that uh, the one I wasn't used to. And uh, actually, the president was very, the president-elect was uh, very affable and courteous and uh, professional, even complimentary. Um, I had written him a note, handwritten note, I'd wrote to both of the candidates the night before the election. And what 
we had done is, and this is always the practice, uh, deployed <coughs> briefing teams to the locations of each of the two candidates. And the objective was to, the uh, morning after the election, be prepared to, to brief whoever was elected their first presidential daily brief for PDB as the president-elect. So I wrote a little, what I thought were kind of pro forma courtesy note to uh, Secretary Clinton and then, uh, as it turned out, President-elect uh, Trump, both essentially said the same thing in which I said this, those community stands by, uh, is eager to support you in the uh, very daunting challenges that you're gonna take on and provide as much insight and enlightenment as we possibly can for all those difficult uh, policy choices and decisions and risks that you'll have to consider. And it was my hope that, that uh, and I addressed, I said the same thing to both, that you would abide by and support and protect the principle of truth to power. Um, and I slipped handwritten notes into each of the two PDBs, one of which, one of the teams, of course, didn't deploy. And President Trump had occasion to uh, comment on that note, uh, about, in fact, not once, but three times when we uh, visited on the, on the 6th of January. And actually, the, the session went pretty well, uh, you know, some pushback on some things that uh, he didn't agree with or didn't like. Um, but by and large, it was uh, a fairly positive uh, exchange, and although I will say I was happy to depart when uh, <laughs> my time was up. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the, the following week, on the 10th of January, is uh, a press conference in which we referred to the intelligence community as uh, Nazis. And uh, I just, felt I couldn't let that pass, that I had to uh, speak up on behalf of the, uh, the rank and file, the men and women of the, national, of the intelligence community. So I uh, asked my secretary to try to put in a call to New York, the Trump Tower, and amazingly he took the call. It blew me away when he did that. You know, I had, I had nine days left at this point, so I didn't figure I had a whole lot to lose. But I did, <laughs> I did feel that I had to say something about uh, that and the fact that, uh, and I tried to impart to him that he was inheriting a national treasure in the form of the national intelligence community. And what that the advantage that was going to, to, to give him. And that I kind of, I don't know, said something in there about the importance of truth to power and that I hope he would uh, protect that. I was trying to appeal to his sort of higher instincts, I guess. But uh, what I uh, discerned, not only from some of the commentary uh, during or at the end of the briefing, was what clouded all this was that the intelligence community assessment served to cast doubt on the uh, veracity of uh, the legit legitimacy of, of his election. And that sort of gave rise to, I think, uh, another narrative, alternative facts. Uh, we were Nazis. Uh, this is all hoax. This is a fake, which, of course, had occasion, that theme had occasion to repeat, unfortunately, in, uh, in Poland in the presence of uh, foreign, foreign uh, uh, representatives, which I think was uh, unfortunate. So now we have this whole world of uh, alternative facts, uh, and unfortunately what is, that is giving rise to in this country is, is differing uh, realities of fact. And uh, Mike alluded to this, but uh, all of us in intelligence, if you've occupied senior position in intelligence, you will have had your ups and downs with uh, the media. I certainly did. But I don't know of a time when a free and independent media is more important to, the, to this country. We're under, uh, I believe, uh, our institutions are, are under assault. Uh, I, I said this on a CNN interview with Jake Tapper in last February. Um, uh, externally from, from the Russians. And this to me is, is is the big message here, and, and for frankly, is a lot more important, as, as important as it is, I don't mean to minimize it, but it's much more important than collusion, whether there was collusion or not. 
the bigger message here, and one of the reasons that, I, that I'm following in, in Mike's footsteps and to speak out publicly, uh, Mike's, Mike's a tremendous role model for me in doing that, is to try to do what I can to educate the public about this profound threat to our very system. In the collusion business, that'll all work out, that'll pan out somehow, but the bigger threat, which the American public has got to be aware of, is the threat posed by the Russians who are bent on undermining our system. They are not our friends. They sought intentionally, as we pointed out in the intelligence community assessment, to sow discord and discontent and, and to promote these varying versions of truth. And uh, one of the things we must do is try to educate uh, the electorate about that. So. We're in a new world, uh, as I discovered, first discovered on uh, the 6th of January. And a uh, fora like this, I think, helped to cast light and help us all remember the importance of, of fact. So I'll stop. Jim, thank you. And, and Nicole, that's a perfect handoff. Before, before I come to you about the role of the press and all this, Jim, I've got one tactical operational question. You, um, so you went up there and briefed. You, you, you know, I've talked about it. You laid it all out. Um, there's a subplot there about the, the dicey dossier that, you know, complicated yeah. life. But that wasn't that. part of the briefing. Wasn't, so I understand why you kept it separate. Later that afternoon, the transition team issued a statement. It was about three paragraphs. One was, God bless the Intel guys. Aren't they great? Uh, the second was, they told, us about a, they told us we had a cyber problem, which I think is a horribly narrow characterization of your briefing. And then they said, you said, this had no effect yeah. on the outcome of the election. Talk about that and between friends and these other 400 people yeah. who were here. <laughs> what was the decision process not to publicly push back on the mischaracterization? Well, actually, we, we did. Um, we did push back, maybe not. We didn't have the, the stage, perhaps, that they did. But um, what we did say is that we saw no evidence of influencing or messing with voter tallies, which is true. That's not to say there wasn't. We didn't see any evidence of it. We did not say anything about the impact on the election because the intelligence community has neither the charter nor the capability or the resources to do that. We don't assess, uh, some people may take issue with this, but we don't assess our own domestic uh, scene or, or our own domestic uh, politics. So we did did try to push back, push back at the end of the briefing because they started writing the press notice, the press release before we left, <laughs> and tried to say that. And I pushed back. We all did push back at that at that moment. Uh, and that is, you know, since on occasion been been repeated that we we said that there was no impact on the election. We never said that. D couldn't say it. Uh, I do think now that we have a better understanding since the publication of the intelligence community assessment on the 6th of January, and we have more granularity, more fidelity on, on the magnitude of what uh, and the scope of what the Russians did, uh, I think it stretches credulity to uh, think that it had no impact. But we have no way of measuring that empirically. Thank you. Okay, Nicole, so, so Jim's mentioned uh, kind of sense up a heightened sense of kinship with the press, yeah. all right? Uh, and you, you've obviously been in the White House. I want to talk to you about that later, too. But, but in your role as a member of the press, um, I watch you, I watch your network, I watch the other networks. How do you avoid, in, in responding to some of the things that Jim has laid out, how do you avoid losing your identity as the press and sliding into either the appearance or reality that you're the opposition or the resistance? Well, you know, this is something that newsrooms everywhere are wrestling with. And I think I have the good fortune of, of, um, of being here amid unimpeachable sources. And I think every anchor is his or her own editor of what is an unimpeachable source. Um, and thank you for including me oh. in this group and for inviting me to be here um, and, and share a stage with all of you. But what used to be an unimpeachable source, your word, your word, your words, um, 
is now described as fake news by the commander in chief and 33% of the country accepts that description. Um, what we try to do is um, sort of put on whatever it is that shields you from dirt bombs and hate bombs and bots and attacks and, and sort of live in that which is unimpeachable. And I work at NBC and MSNBC and, and, and we, we make different judgments than, than um, CNN, where, where I know you are, and, and, and we know the voices that we trust as sort of editors of our own programs. Um, we have seen that the president's attacks on the media have had the opposite of his desired uh, result. His desire is that nobody trusts anyone other than his favorite media outlets. And his favorite media outlets are doing fine. But year to year, we're doing even better. So there is an appetite. Uh, I got chills when I read the title of this program because I never think of it that way, truth tellers inside the bunker. But that is what we are. And what, what we try to keep in mind and where we find just in our own hour a little bit of irreverence is that um, the bunker is where he'd like us to stay. And so we, 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 we sort of refuse to, to stay there and we try to call out a shiny object. Today we learned that Bob Mueller, another unimpeachable source, another unimpeachable um, truth teller, uh, unsealed three indictments and we learned that a young campaign aide had pled guilty months ago and has been cooperating with an investigation that Donald Trump still describes as a hoax. So. We try to stay focused, and our oxygen is the unimpeachable sort of first-hand accounts of people like yourselves. Um, my show is animated by what I know to be the normal relationship between a White House and the press, which is supposed to be grumpy and sometimes hostile. <laughs> and you and I, I think, forged a friendship defending enhanced interrogation techniques, um, which the media would have you believe was used on every third child. Um, uh, you know, the fights that we used to have seemed quaint and charming and like a, a version of, of a dating show. Um, but, but they often ended, you know, too, you're laughing. I mean, screaming matches over um, metadata collection, over enhanced interrogation. You know, friendships were ended. Now, I don't even know that the White House press office gets on the phone and talks to anyone at any of the networks on which we appear. Um, the, the, the attacks on the institutions, um, and, the, and, the, and I, I said this in an interview, my insight into how Trump programs the minds of his base are deeply personal. My parents are not, I did not grow up in a union household. My parents are not racist, they're not misogynist, and I didn't know they were angry. They are diehard Trump supporters. And every day before I go on live television on the Today Show or the 4 o'clock, I pull back from anything that I don't have from two, three, four unimpeachable sources like the people on this stage because a Trump voter and Trump himself needs us to be wrong, this wrong, one time, and he's got an exhibit you know, to, to take to his 33% of the country and bury us. So I would posit that journalism <coughs> has never been truer than in the time of Trump. We have never been more careful than at a time when, like your product, he is disparaging our product at a pace and from a level that has just really never happened in sort of modern American presidential politics. Um, but, but just talking about this briefing, you came on, um, I was filling in for Brian Williams that week, and you came on, and I think you're supposed to be there eight minutes. We, we held you hostage for about 26. <laughs> but we had this conversation because you know, I worked for a president who was judged very harshly by the media for some things that um, were policy disagreements and some things that, that, that he got wrong. And, and one of them was an assessment about WMD in Iraq. Um, but it was viewed as sacred, this relationship between a president and the intelligence community. And it was so startling and it blew all my circuits to hear the president-elect talk about the intelligence community. And some of it was was I, know what, I knew what was normal, and I knew how 
George W. Bush had handled ups and downs, difficult times. But I had never seen anything like a president-elect or someone who was going to be the president, who was going to be the, the number one client and consumer of American intelligence, disparage his own intelligence community. And, and I remember we, we just kept going around and around. What, I kept, what happens next? <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he is the commander in chief. He will make decisions of, that affect our war and peace based on the product. How can he call them Nazis? And, you know, what, what we try to do, I guess, to put it simply, is to live in the moment. And, and, and the moment I described is, is the moment it, that, that we are conducting journalism. Um, uh, under attack in a bunker um, to call out things that are not normal, the sort of disparaging of the intelligence community, the eight-day war with a gold star widow. That's not normal. And so the White House would call every morning, why won't you let it go? And I said, do you follow the president on Twitter? When he <laughs> lets it go, I'll let it go. So, you know, before we came out here, I, 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 um, mentioned to General Hayden that I, I, I cover this White House by talking to them. I, I call half a dozen White House sources a day. And um, on any given day, I'd say about 77% of them call me back. But during this, this, this fight with the um, Gold Star Widow, I said, why can't someone explain to him that this is not normal? This is one of the last sacred things. People who lose someone defending and protecting the country, why can't you explain that to him? And I didn't get a good answer, but I think this idea, and, and, and if the center can further an understanding of why the truth has to stay one of those sacred things that can't be lost. I mean, I, I feel like so much has, has been lost in terms of norms, but I think without this, it's hard to explain to future generations why we didn't do more and why we didn't do anything. And I think the center can just be a place, the kind of place where, where American presidents usually travel to non-democratic societies and talk about the good work that NGOs are doing. The fact that we need this breaks my heart, but the fact that you will be there and sort of protect that which is sacred to our democracy and our system is just so important. I can't think of a more Excellent. important mission. Cool. Thank you. Jack, Nicole just mentioned the word norm, all right? And you had a fascinating article in The Atlantic just a few weeks back in which you said that the president was the most norm-breaking president we've had. If I could just quote, Trump is a Frankenstein's monster of past president's worst attributes. Andrew Jackson's rage, Millard Fillmore's bigotry, James Buchanan's incompetence and spite, Theodore Roosevelt's self-aggrandizement, Richard Nixon's, I could go on, but you, you get the point. <laughs> and, and, and yet, Jack, and I think this is very important, that's not where you end up in the article, all right? You, you worry not that the president may be breaking norms, but those in the bunker, those pushing back may also be breaking norms, which will also have a harm on the democracy and on the republic. Right. So let me explain that. Um, first of all, let me say thank you, Mike. It's, it's a really an honor to be here uh, on this inaugural event. Um, General Hayden and I were in some tough times, had some <laughs> tough times together in the government, and I wasn't always bringing him good news, and no one in the government that I dealt with acted, reacted uh, to some of my bad news with more integrity and more of a straight shooter than you did. And it always struck me then, and I've always admired it. And I can't think of anyone better to lead a center like this. Thank so you. congratulations. Um, so let me just start off by saying that I agree with General Clapper that our institutions are under attack, and I'm going to focus on the president. Because we've never, in 200 and some odd years, had a president who was so relentlessly who so relentlessly, I don't see any way, other way to interpret his attacks on the intelligence community, undermining their credibility, his attacks on courts. We've never had a president who attacked courts this way, relentlessly, dishonestly. His attacks on members of his own cabinet, it's completely extraordinary. His attacks on individuals, the brazen way in which he's attacking, and the media, and his extraordinary, relentless attacks on the media. So, and he's really a norm breaker the list is too long of the norms he breaks. Norms that we didn't even know were norms because no one would have ever thought to do otherwise. <laughs> like not take ethics seriously when you're, when you're uh, in the White House or something like that. So I do believe that the, the primary norm breaker by far is the president. Um, and I think he's doing great damage to our institutions. However, there's a lot of concern that he's changing presidential norms. I don't really think that's true. A lot of the things, almost everything except for his attacks on the media, and I'll come back to that, but almost all of his other norm break breaches, I don't think future presidents will follow them. 
because they haven't served him well, except for the attack of the media. I'll get to that in a second. Um, I use the analogy in the um, in the piece. I don't think he's that other presidents are going to attack their attorney general and attack their <laughs> intelligence community. Completely self-defeating attack and independent investigation. Any more than if Trump went out and gave a press conference in the in, in the rose garden in a bathrobe, that would be a breach of a norm. But no president's going to follow that either. <laughs> so I don't think so. While he is the norm breaker extraordinaire, and we've learned a lot, by the way, about the difference between law and norms. I think the law has done a pretty good job of constraining him, as I talk about, and the evidence of that today. We have a really extraordinary a man of extraordinary integrity in leading an independent investigation that many people thought wasn't going to happen after Comey was fired, and in fact, it resulted in this. And uh, whatever else you say about the Justice Department, they have been independent on this matter. Um, and in that, the immigration order, I think the Constitution is working well in keeping him from breaking the law. It wasn't designed to keep him from violating all these norms. But to get to the point you raised, I also think that some of the institutions he's attacking are breaking those norm, their norms in response. And these are hard points to make. I uh, use the analogy in the piece about how Marco Rubio, when he was being made fun of as little Marco, he, he had, took it one time too many, and then he started making fun of Donald Trump's size. And that was immediately the point when, when, in which his campaign collapsed, because that was the point at which Rubio, the man of principle, the man above the fray, the optimistic person, kind of went down in the dirt, violated his principles, and he was destroyed. And I fear that some of our institutions in responding to Trump are becoming prey to that. I think the courts in the immigration cases, while they were in the immigration orders, while there have been many problems with those, they've comported themselves in ways, I think, in understandable reaction <coughs> to the president's attacks that haven't always comported with judicial decorum. They haven't always tied their results to their reasoning in the way they usually do. They didn't give the president proper deference. Even Trump deserves it, as the Supreme Court itself said in a more sober moment in, in um, reversing some of what the courts did. I think that the bureaucracy has, has, the resistance in the bureaucracy has been much greater than the uh, usual resistance to a new administration from the bureaucracy. That's normal. And many of the techniques have been new, but the most extraordinary thing that I worry about are the intelligence leaks. Of course, intelligence leaks are not new, but leaks of FISA content information with US person, US person information in it as a selective leak to try to bring down someone in the administration I think that is new. I don't know of any time that's ever happened before. It's happened a lot. And I worry that once that starts, once that norm is broken, that one's not going to go back, I worry. Finally, I'll mention the media, because I think, on the one hand, the media has done just an extraordinary job of covering this president. And it's very difficult. Jim Rutenberg, I think is his name, the media reporter from the New York Times, said that um, it's, it's, it's hard to cover Trump, because when you're covering someone who's constantly lying and constantly doing crazy things, just playing it straight looks oppositional. It appears oppositional. You are describing something that if you're covering him every day, it looks oppositional. Um, and right, if, you, like it, if you say, why is he attacking a gold star widow for the eighth day? They're like, you hate him. I yeah. said, but I didn't tweet about the gold star widow. Right. He did. That's right. But that's, that's exactly right. And if you don't evidence. cover it, then you're normalizing, normalizing it. it. Yeah. So the, <clears throat> the press is in a very difficult situation with this type of president, it's unprecedented. On the other hand, I think the press is shell-shocked. I've talked to a lot of journalists. I've seen that they're, they're kind of, they're in the bunker, really. And I do think the press has, this is a qualitative judgment. Um, I'll use Bob Woodward as my authority. He said that the, the press was, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but drinking from the fire hose of the anti-Trump Kool-Aid. And uh, it does come, there, there has been negative reporting of a type, many studies show this, that we've never seen before in covering a president. Some people say, and there's no way to know whether maybe he deserves it because of the way he's acted, but to people who are in the middle of the country or who are his supporters, it doesn't look that way. There has been, that's the way that social media works with reporters tweeting and letting their hair down and really showing how much they dislike the president, how much they disrespect him, making clear what their politics are, and their news gets interpreted through that lens. So much so that Dean Backe, the, the, the executive editor of the New York Times, just clamped down on his reporters tweeting because he knew this was such a problem. So I do think that our institutions have, have re violated their own norms in reacting to the president. And those are, and again, I'm not really blaming them because they've been under assault themselves. But those are the norms that I worry about the most. And if I could just, uh, the norm breaches I worry about the most because I fear those are going to be harder to recover. And indeed, I even think if I thought the president were devious enough. I don't really attribute too much self-reflection to him, but indeed his attacks inviting these responses are part of the process of the downward spiral of all of our institutions. I really do believe that. 
Let me just say finally on the media, it is the problem that we see today with uh, truth is something that began before Trump became president. It relates to a lot of things. I think it relates primarily to the growth of the internet, primarily to the growth of social media, to the idea that people are self-selecting their news. Speech is so cheap to produce now. It used to be there were just a few outlets, speakers couldn't get out. Everyone can speak now and everyone can filter and everyone can go into their own bubbles and news and information is being provided in a highly fragmented way and people are absorbing that. And because speech is so cheap to produce and because we have an open society and a First Amendment, it's easy for private speech to drown out other private speech. It's easier in this environment for misinformation and propaganda and the like. And then all of these factors have a kind of um, ripple effect in enhancing the, the social incohesion that is already going on in our country and in making discourse more coarse. So all of this stuff is getting worse, but I think that the problems are, it's not just Trump. I think he's part of the, the he's not the cause, he's the effect in a way, and he's enhancing it. But we have deep structural problems about uh, the way information is communicated. I don't know how to fix it. I'm very pessimistic. Okay, thank you. Mark, you're, you're here representing scholarship, and you're also a scholar on a particularly relevant topic. So let me ask you maybe a, a, a two-part question. Uh, one is, these institutions here represented already feel under attack, the judiciary, right. press, um, intelligence. Does scholarship yet feel under attack other than just the broad atmospherics within the society, hmm. one? And okay. then secondly, since, since you have studied the, the power of the executive, mm -hmm. what do you think, where do you think this experience leaves the American presidency? Uh-huh. Well, we're under attack, um, too. That's not altogether new, though, right? Uh, there have been organizations uh, for years. Uh, back in the 1980s, it was accuracy in academia, right? There was accuracy in media followed by accuracy in academia. These sort of outside groups who always projected the viewpoint that there's an inherent bias to scholarship, to what we do in the classroom, and they want to call us out. They want to hold us accountable, and I think that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, we should be held accountable for what we do. Uh, I rejected many of the premises, of course, of um, their analyses that we were so inherently biased or ideological in a particular direction. But I think like much of what you're hearing about the relationship between the president and the press, uh, which is being driven in part by this kind of populist movement, right, that Trump tapped into. Um, you know, he didn't create something out of nothing. Uh, there's been frustration, anger at traditional institutions and practices in our society for years. And he tapped into these in a special way, and I don't mean that in a positive sense of the word, right? He was able to, to sort of leverage that anger and use it for uh, his own, own power into the system. Uh, so that's there. Uh, and we have to accept the reality of it. And as I told many of my colleagues and friends during the election last year, uh, who would say, how is it that people are attracted to this guy? Why is he getting the support? And I said, you, you can't look down on these people. That's not the right response, okay? Uh, he's, he's tapping into some deeply felt feelings out, uh, sentiments in our society about changes in our economy, lost opportunities. You know, the list, the list goes on. The frustrations are real. We have to acknowledge it, and we have to find ways to address it intelligently. Um, I think what we do in academia right now, I tell the um, incoming students, but also prospective students, when we have open house events and we're trying to say, come here and study at George Mason University, and they're thinking about, do I want a career in public schools, in the public policy school, right? Uh, in this particular environment, do I want to devote myself to public affairs, public policy, public service? And my message to them is, you're more important now than ever before. Uh, come, we need you now. Um, you know, we need good people in government. Some of my Republican friends who said, if asked, I would not join this administration. I understand why they feel that way. That's a difficult choice everybody has to make. But others said, if I'm called, I'll serve because I think good people are needed right now, and these folks really need some help. Um, so, you know, I look, academia in the past has been under attack, but I think what's going on particularly with the media, though, more than academia right now, because a much more amplified voice to the public than we do. Um, the attack 
checking of the legitimacy of institutions, the challenging of you know, fundamentally what we do as somehow corrupt, intended to mislead, okay, uh, to misinform, to bias the views of people in a particular direction uh, due to some, I don't quite understand this, uh, you know, agenda that we're all using our, our positions of authority to try to project onto uh, other people. Uh, again, the fact that that sentiment is out there, it's real. We have to address it, I think, intelligently. Um, in an earlier stage of my career, very quickly, I wrote several books on the relationship between the media and the presidency. And I, I spent a lot of time interviewing not only journalists, but members of White House communications offices and press secretaries and assistant press secretaries. Time and again, after administrations had been completed, and I had these conversations also, um, you know, in the case of one president and um, high level presidential advisors. <clears throat> sure, there were some bad feelings about the way this or that president was covered, but they always accepted the legitimacy of what folks in the media were doing, and there was a respect there. And not once did I hear uh, people from within administrations personally attacking uh, individuals or questioning the legitimacy of the enterprise. I think that's the environment we're in right now. It makes me really sad as somebody who's been uh, teaching America, American government and institutions for over three decades. And with what voice we have in academia, uh, we need to do as much as we can to try to counter that. Um, you know, so it heartens me to hear Nicole Wallace say that the media are doubling down and doing better uh, than ever before because of this environment and because of how much uh, presenting accurately what's going on in government and society is needed, especially now. Okay, great. I'm going to come back down this way yes. with one follow-on question for folks and then sure. get ready with your questions. In fewer than 10 minutes, we'll have some microphones for people to ask directly to our panelists. Um, Jack, let me, let me just come back to you and pivot off a little bit of what Mark said. Um, so you've got the power of the presidency, the things you and I had our most intense conversations about was exactly what did Article II allow the president to do on his raw constitutional authorities. Now, we've seen Congress, and I understand that's not constitutional, but Congress in statute has passed sanctions without giving the president the normal waiver authority that, frankly, makes sanctions make sense. Right. And so they denied that to this president, even knowing that, abstractly, that's not a very good idea. Um, do you see a shift in the actual power of the office based upon the events that are now unfolding? Uh, yes and no. There's no doubt you know, checks on the presidency and the scope of executive power is always contextual. It's, and it always depends on the president's perceived legitimacy and the extent to which the president is trusted. You can see this in court cases especially, that, that presidents that enjoy large stores of trust uh, tend to get a, catch a break from courts. But it's true more generally. There's no doubt that our institutions, all of, them, all of the checking institutions on the presidency, are deeply distrustful of this presidency. That's why the courts have been going overboard to push back much more aggressively than they have been and perhaps should have. That's why the media is going overboard. So the checks all are, overboard may not be the right word, that's why they're supercharged. Maybe <laughs> that's a better way of putting it. Um, so I definitely think that this president is going to be constrained in ways that other presidents haven't been. I don't believe that it will have a permanent impact on the presidency. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., the famous historian of the imperial presidency, said that the presidency was indestructible. And the reason it's indestructible is because it's so vital to the proper operation of our government, to have a vigorous executive. Um, and I do think that our institutions will constrain this president to the extent it can. There's a lot it can't do. There's just one of the other things we're learning is how much enormous, we, some of us knew this, but we're learning it even more, how much enormous discretion within the law the president has to do stupid things, to make terrible <laughs> judgments, to send the government, the country down a terrible path. And law But, but, is, but today, a, a judge we both know, Cora Catelli, yes. intervened on the president's ability to organize the armed forces. Yeah, that's right, that, which is probably wouldn't have happened in another administration, although... This is the, on the, but trans, the transgender issue. But the order wouldn't have been issued by tweet either. Yeah. So, I mean, this is... And, 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 also, and also, you have, um, you know, and it, you have a really extraordinarily powerful independent investigator as well. So the answer is I do think that this president will be find himself handcuffed by the institutions 
that are trying to keep him from doing things he wants to do because they so distrust him. But I don't think it will have a permanent effect on the presidency. In the modern era, and this is a Jacksonian president, do we get him repeating Jackson about the Supreme Court having made their decision? Let, Let him enforce, him enforce it? it? I don't believe so. There was a moment um, when everyone worried about this, when the first nationwide injunction was issued in the immigration order. And there were rumors that people at the, at the, at the, in the customs offices were being told not to comply with the order. The, the cable shows were, and the Twitter feeds were full of concern that the president was going to defy the order. I'm sure he would have liked to. But this sort of unknown federal judge in Seattle issued the injunction and Trump complied. And I'm sure that the, re I don't know why. We don't know why, hopefully we'll learn one day. I'm sure that the reason he complied is because it was the third week of his presidency and even then, I think his administration would have melted down because of the people around him, the permanent people and even the new appointees. That's really all it is that keeps a president from saying, I'm not gonna comply with the order, but it's an extremely powerful norm. And the fact that Trump complied with it on that signature issue, I don't think we'll see him doing that. Okay. Thank you. Nicole, you, you mentioned you know, your commitment to the truth, multiple sourcing, if you can't go with it because you don't want to be vulnerable, particularly to the kinds of attacks, you, you don't want to give justification to it, right? Mm -hmm. I get that. And I think like all of us, I channel surf, I, I go back and forth between the three seven, seven by 24s. And, and, and frankly, I, I don't know that they all apply that evenly. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but I do know there is a clear distinction on the topics they choose yeah. to talk about. You want, you want to talk a little bit about how that works or doesn't? Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone was ever a waitress or a bus girl, but I was, and it forever changed the way I tip. And sort of being an anchor, <laughs> being an anchor having been a White House communications director and sort of railed against story selection, I always felt like the real institutional bias or the real power of the media had nothing to do with anybody anything anybody said on television. It had to do with the stories they selected. Um, so I, 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 I think what you're saying is that we almost have three channels that select three different, I mean, it's not even like we're all eating. It's like right. one is a restaurant, one is a gym, and one is a, <laughs> right, a Taekwondo class. I mean, you know, we're not even all eating anymore. But I, I you know, I mean, my personal experience, you know, my show was named by the president of the network after the White House because my experience and my point of view was the White House. And I probably, you know, I don't know, but I, I don't know that I would have a show. I probably wouldn't have a show on MSNBC if Donald Trump hadn't won, and it probably wouldn't be called Deadline White House. But, you know, we select stories in our hour that are, that are I, I mean, like you, I, I and, and you, I mean, I um, am horrified by anyone that extends any uh, disdain to a Trump voter. I mean, they, a Trump voter and a Hillary voter went to the ballot box with the same goal, to have the best country that we could have for our kids and grandkids. But they came to totally different conclusions about who could do that. Um, so, I mean, you know, from, from my point of view, we, we spent a lot of time on story selection. And today we did one story. We, and, did, and, we didn't even and, do all three indictments. And not the we lead. The and not the lead that most people saw. I did not lead with Manafort. Why, why did you go so with So I, lead? you know, I had the privilege of working with Bob Mueller because right. you guys briefed George W. Bush before the press officers went in and told the president how crummy his press was that day. That's how different <laughs> things were. He wanted to know about the world and whether we were safe uh, from, from the, the men and women who kept us safe. And then he wanted to hear about um, uh, how you know, how he was getting beat up in the press, which was usually the case during the Bush presidency. Um, so I, I got to know um, Bob Mueller in, the, in that tiny space outside the Oval Office coming and going. And, um, and I, I find one of the norms to be most disturbing, the, the attacks on a special counsel. I mean, Pat Fitzgerald investigated the Bush White House and the um, leaking of, of Valerie Plame's name. She was a, um, a CIA agent, and her name was... Uh, leaked during um, the first term of the Bush presidency, and there was a special counsel that, that carried over to the second term of the Bush presidency. And as mad as we were, nobody ever attacked Pat Fitzgerald. I mean, so, so to me, there was one story today, and it's, it was this existential question about whether Mueller is safe, which to me is just another norm. I, I, it's hard having worked in a White House, under investigation, by a special prosecutor, 
to imagine a White House attacking the special prosecutor. You, no one likes to be investigated, but, but that was never a conversation. That was never a consideration. And I fielded a vast majority of the press calls because I was off at the campaign and didn't have my clearances when the, when the, the name was shared with the press. Um, so we focus a lot on Bob Mueller because I, I know what's supposed to happen. I know what's normal when you're under investigation. But today, we didn't really cover the Manafort story because the younger um, aide being uh, arrested and pleading guilty in July um, and sharing everything that he knew as a campaign aide was something having worked on multiple presidential campaigns that to me seemed like the treasure trove of known unknowns. Um, to, to borrow Rumsfeldism, and, and to me, to be the development today that posed more questions. And so I think, you know, Laura Ingram's show debuts tonight. She has General Kelly. I highly doubt uh, Mr. Papadopoulos' name will come up. But I think, I think what you're getting at is that, is that bias and um, sort of the scrutiny of the press goes beyond just getting your facts right. We're in a climate where the three different cable channels are selecting entirely different news diets for their viewers. So very quickly, uh, in, your, in your other life, uh, White House <laughs> Communications Director, and this is not an invitation to be judgmental. I really don't want you to be. Uh, this, the, how many sigmas from the operation you were director for and what's going on now? What's, what, what do you see... It's just not even a, there's, you know, Hope Hicks is the, is the woman with the title, communications director. She may be utterly brilliant. She may actually be the best communications practitioner to ever hold that job, but we'll never know. Because the president doesn't, doesn't you know, he became the leader of the free world without someone with that job. So you can't convince a man or a woman probably that, that, a, that a communications director is essential if you, became the most powerful person in the world without one. So there's no evidence, you know, and I, and I said this last week when, when the White House was really upset at us for covering the president's eight-day battle with the Gold Star Widow. I said, listen, if you had a message today, I don't know what it was, because the president was live tweeting his response to a widow who was crying on GMA. So they don't drive a message in any traditional sense, but that's not to say that they're not able to. They may right. be very good at it. They just work for a president who doesn't permit them to do so. Okay. Jim, I'm going to ask an unfair question to, to end. Um, and, and neither you and I will ever be involved in commenting on the performance of people who come after us in the job. All right? But, uh, but I, I do want to ask you. So you've got a president who, who doesn't have background in this, all right? which is not a crime. It just, this is not something his life experience in terms of our business that it's prepared him for. Um, he's, he's not particularly a reader. Um, prone to action as opposed to reflection. All right. How would you brief them? Well, the way we evolved <clears throat> during the uh, campaign, when, uh, when we started briefing both the candidates, and we had to uh, adapt to uh, his style. And we, uh, wait, wait, wait. We, we do that with every president. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's uh, typical of, uh, of, of everyone. I mean, President Bush had a different style for ingesting uh, the PDB. We would have a briefer that would walk through each, each article. President Obama didn't do that. He, uh, he read it, and that was a primary means of ingesting information. So ad adapting to uh, differing styles is, is not a new thing, and clearly uh, our current president has a completely different style, and he is uh, much more uh, verbal uh, or, uh, or, or ingests information that's presented to him graphically uh, rather than uh, reading uh, uh, you know, reading information. So, but that's that's not uh, unusual. I so, mean, but, but every president has has, has a different. A so different you, style. after a while, though, I mean, I my expert life experience with President Bush, and it was his second term, so he was he was well steeped in this right. stuff. He had deep background. I think uh, President Obama, kind of being a policy wonk all of his life, had had fairly deep background. So now you've got a, a President Trump, all right, who who doesn't have deep background, but you don't want to insult him either. That's right. You, I mean, you don't want to insult his intelligence. So how, I describe our process as taking someone from the mutually known and pulling them to something they don't yet know. Yeah. But you have to know your departure point. How would you do that? Well, for, for one, one point I should make here is that uh, by design, uh, I did not, nor did my principal deputy, Stephanie O'Sullivan, we made a conscious judgment we were not going to participate 
in any briefings to either candidate. So we picked a professional that uh, was on the ODI staff, who uh, will remain nameless tonight, because <laughs> he's still doing it. God bless him. <laughs> and uh, and he, we knew him to be a very talented, experienced, you know, lots of depth in the intelligence community, and a, a and a really good communicator. And he he was able to adjust to uh, President Trump's style, and we. All we, we just stood back and gave him all the support that he needed and made sure he had the right experts whenever we'd form up a team to go, to go brief, but neither Stephanie nor I had anything to do uh, with this process. And um, uh, President-elect Trump had occasion to uh, actually praise him uh, to me when uh, we were there on the 6th of January, and as I said, God bless him, he's still doing it. Um, I think he's got maybe till the midterms, I think he's going to retire after that, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I, again, that's not, uh, there's nothing wrong with that inherently. And of course, for President Trump, the first time he was exposed to classified information, let alone intelligence, was when all this, when all this started. Uh, with President Obama, by the time I showed up, I, I, you know, it had, uh, Denny Blair had been the DNI for 16 months, so, and President Obama had served as a senator, so he had, you know, he had some exposure to intelligence. He wasn't starting from uh, uh, square A, which uh, which President uh, President Leck was. So that's up. To, that's on the uh, that's on the intelligence community to adjust to that. And uh, whatever uh, tutorials that uh, need to be given, they give them, and and do it in such a way that uh, you're not. Uh, insulting. Good. That's that's an art form. There's no question. But it's our responsibility. It, yeah. That's on us. That's right. Yeah. All right. Good point to end this part on. Uh, we've got some runners with some microphones. So if folks have questions, raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you right away. Here we go. And position the other mics with some other folks who have their hands up too, please. Okay, yes ma'am. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to hearing you speak. It's been very interesting. Um, without injecting too much politics into my question, but it um, was briefly brought up, um, do you feel that with the previous administrations in terms of, um, obviously what comes to mind first, the issue with the mistrust of how the weapons of mass destruction that led to the war in Iraq has affected now President Trump's ability to question the legitimacy and the information that is provided from the intelligence community, meaning that it was such a big point in our history that's now led to right. a war that's still ongoing and has affected, obviously, the American public so much versus something that might have happened on a smaller scale that's easier to forget with the passage right. of time. But this obviously is something that has had long-going consequences. How do you feel that's continue to affect the intelligence community? Jim, I'll, obviously your question, but the president did tweet in December when you pushed more news of the Russian, more news of the Russian story got out there. Yeah. He said, this is from the same guys who brought yeah. you the yeah. WMD thing. Actually, uh, he's, he was right. He's one of the, because my fingerprints were on that uh, weapons of mass destruction national intelligence estimate that was published in October 2002. I should add, I was in the room with Jim when we approved well, it. We both were. Uh, <laughs> I think the important point here is, which of course gets lost in all, in all the rhetoric, is uh, what we have done, the intelligence community has done to uh, improve our processes and, and to uh, prevent uh, a recurrence of what happened then in 2002. And obviously, you know, we, we made a big mistake. Uh, but the important thing is, what have we learned and what have we instituted in the intervening 15 years uh, since that happened? And we d and, uh, done a lot. First, or one of, one of the primary uh, improvements was uh, at the time that uh, and Mike and I were on, the, and I think, the same meeting, uh, the National Intelligence Board approved that meeting. And one of the things we do today, which, and this goes back to George Tenet's time when he was a DCI, was the first thing we do at a National Intelligence Board meeting when we vet a national intelligence estimate is a review of the sources. And every uh, intelligence component 
who has a foot, one footnote at least in a national intelligence estimate has to stand up and, and attest to the veracity of the collection sources. And each of the agency directors now has to sign a memo attesting to the veracity of those sources. So that's just one thing, you know, red teaming, what if we're wrong, um, and lots of other uh, variations on a theme to, to test uh, the, the premises uh, and the, and the uh, key judgments in those national intelligence estimates. So, I mean, you, there's no denying history. Yeah, that happened. And uh, the big mistake had profound impact on, you know, the, the genesis of our invading Iraq and all that. So that was, uh, that was, a, that was a bad interlude. But that, to me, the important thing is all the improvements and enhancements and safeguards that have been built into how we do this since that happened. Good. Who's got a mic? Yep. My name is Zach Marks. All right, I tried that. My name is Zach Marks. I'm a first year grad student, uh, George Mason, taking a class with Director Hayden. Uh, I want to know, I don't think this has a good answer, but how do the truth tellers educate those that don't want to be educated? You talked about self-selecting. How do we tell the people that select the news that might not be mo the most truth? How do, how do we influence those individuals? Uh, <laughs> I mean, as I said, when I made that remark, I don't have the solution. And um, we live in a free society. There are, are a multiplicity is, is too weak a word for the number of news sources. The ability to live in communities that are self-affirming, to live in bubbles. We all live in them to some degree, but it's very easy to do it now. And you... Um, my colleague Cass Sunstein wrote a book once where he said that people should be forced to, he didn't quite say this, but he was one of the first ones to identify this 20 years ago. He said the internet allows people to have a daily me. And he suggested that the daily me might not be a good thing for our public discourse, for deliberative democracy. He was right. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. He proposed forcing certain content providers to provide alternate points of view. That, that was possible in a world of web pages and blogs circa 2000. In a world of social media, first of all, I'm not sure it would be constitutional. But it's just very, very hard to force people to see views they don't want to. And we live in a world now where people can just opt into self-affirming viewpoints. I think it's one of the fundamental problems we face because that attitude fosters conspiracy theories. It allows misinformation to travel around. I'm not just saying it's not a left-right thing. It happens in every community. And I don't have, people are talking now about, um, all of the solutions seem bad to me, involve government regulating speech uh, more than it is, much more forcing social media to regulate speech and to tell us what, what is true and what isn't true and what we should and shouldn't watch. All the alternatives seem bad to me. I'm sorry I don't have a solution. I'm very pessimistic. Well, I, I, I would say, I think part of it is, 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 that's just a symptom. I mean, part of the thing, part of the problem is in, it's not about educating those who refuse. You know, that again, a Trump voter would feel like is an inherently condescending sort of question. So I think, I think the, the other piece of it is there are no more national experiences. Yeah. There's nothing that happens to everyone anymore. Um, I mean, I, I tweeted last night, uh, dear baseball, thank you for saving America, because I thought like for three and a half hours, like there was one set of facts, there was one thing everyone could agree on. I personally wept for most of the home runs. There were so many, even I started stopped weeping. But I was like, finally, something we can all agree is actually happening. Um, but even, th you know, the, the shooting in, in Las Vegas was so um, devastating. And, and what's amazing to me is the cannibalization of news. Everything is so fast. Before Lester Holt could get to Nice after the horrifically heinous terror attack last summer. Before he landed and could do one newscast, people had moved on. Something else happened. I don't remember what it was. But the pace of, of, of events is so accelerated that there, there are precious few sort of shared experiences. So it's almost like getting people before the dissemination of information is too late. You're right. They're already, they're already separated out. The, the, the other question to address, and I'm, I'm confident, I said this to General Hayden, that your generation is going to save all of us. <laughs> um, uh, I'll send you my resume. We will end up working for people like you that have that, that have sort of, that apply technology and innovation to these problems. But why don't we have more shared experiences? Because the information is just, it's the tail. 
the head is we don't really go through anything collectively anymore. Great. Who's got a mic? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Tyler Gray. I did my undergrad at George Mason, and this is a fantastic event. Um, I would ask uh, what recommendations any of you would have if you were the CEO of Twitter or Facebook to change things. So what could someone with power and influence do who runs a social media company or a large business to help make democracy in the small sense here better? Any volunteers? Well, I'll start. Uh, I think you raise a great question. And I, again, like Jack, I, I don't have an answer for this. But I do uh, wonder about what... I'll call it municipal or civil responsibility that providers have for discerning the pedigree of, of information, particularly ads, that they, they promulgate. Now, I, I don't know the answer to that because this, this smacks of uh, infringing on free speech, but we do have regulatory uh, regimens for uh, you know, the FCC, the Federal Communications Communication, well, uh, the Commission, which does have some regulatory or oversight uh, responsibility for what, what's broadcast, and, you know, which doesn't, as far as I understand, doesn't really apply to, to you know, tw to Twitter and Facebook and all that. So, so it does raise the issue. You, it's a great question. I, again, like Jack, I don't have a, a good answer uh, for this. Uh, I just know that uh, where we are today is, uh, you know, we're not in a good place here. I, I share Jack's constitutional concerns, and so perhaps, um, perhaps we're smart enough, in fact, I know we are, um, that our social media platforms can actually distinguish between something being done by a human being and something not being done by a human being. Because I, I think an awful lot of the trending uh, that's created and pushing news to the front is, is not done by persons, but done by bots. Yeah, if I could say, if you look, Facebook has written a couple of short memos about this, and these companies are really in all hands on deck mode trying to figure this out. And the things you just mentioned are the low hanging fruit. There's no reason why there should be fake accounts, and there's no reason why you should have computerized bots just churning this stuff. And I think those are the first two th things that we can make some progress on. After that, you have to get to substance, and that's yeah, when it gets hard. That's hard. Who's got a mic? Over here. Thank you. I think we all agree the Constitution protects free speech of Americans to influence each other, but can we do more to either block or dispute foreign influence? Foreign influence. Jim, you want to talk a little bit about what actually happened in terms I'm, of the foreign, the, foreign, the foreign influence in the American information space, what, what the Russians did during the campaign? Oh. Well, and, and, and the question was, can we do anything to block that? First of all, there's, there's a long history of the Russians interfering in elections, theirs and other people's. And we have documented records of <clears throat> going back to the 60s with the Russians <laughs> interfering or trying to influence uh, the election. The 2016 election was different because of the uh, aggressiveness and the multiple enablers that, you know, all the marvelous technology, the Internet, uh, of affords them, and it just gave them a whole new, a whole array of tool sets, which they use to a fairly well. So RT's propaganda, which is very slick and sophisticated, by the way, very pro-Trump, very anti-Clinton. And of course, we're now seeing the, uh, with greater, as I said earlier, greater granularity and fidelity, what they did in the way of influencing uh, social media. Uh, how they, uh, and of course, again, remember, their first objective, which, which they, and they succeeded to a fairly well, was just to sow discord, discontent, and doubt about our system. And wherever they could to promote schisms, uh, drive wedges within our society, uh, appeal to uh, Black Lives Matter, white supremacists, didn't matter, just to sow a discord and discontent. And then, of course, even more bothersome was the, their involvement in sort of the microanalysis of individual voting precincts. I had to think, uh, and I don't have any basis for this, but I just would speculate they had to have some help to do that somehow. So it was the variety, and, and not to mention, of course, the hacking of uh, the DNC and uh, the promulgation of uh, those, those emails. Um, and just to show you, you know, 
what can happen sometimes. We had a big debate about uh, in the interagency about putting out a statement about what the Russians were doing, which eventuated in a statement that Jay Johnson and uh, Secretary of Homeland Security and I put out on the 7th of October, which of course got completely emasculated by the, uh, I call it excess Hollywood tapes, uh, audio tapes. So our message, we debated and agonized over and staffed through the interagency about what the Russians were doing, which was pretty forthright, we thought, got lost. So the Russians, uh, very, very sophisticated, direct, aggressive campaign. And by the way, you know, don't think they're going to quit because all this, what they've done, what they did, is going to embolden them to continue to do it. And that's, again, to me, is a big message here for uh, the American public. To follow up on what Jim just said, but Nicole said earlier, um, the technical term for what the Russians did was a covert influence campaign. And I, I'd be the last person on stage to claim our government's never attempted same, all right, somewhere at some point in the world. But there's an absolute rule of thumb that covert influence campaigns cannot create fractures in a society. Covert influence campaigns identify and exploit pre-existing fractures. So your comment about we're divided before the information comes out is, is really the fundamental issue. Who's got the mic now? Yes. Yeah, hi, uh, Andrew Patterson, PhD student at GMU, also in the class with General Hayden. Take the Trump phenomenon globally, that he's more an indicator, as maybe Nicole pondered. As you look around the globe at who's consolidating power, you've got Merkel forming a Republican government without the socialists. Hollande got flushed. Modi's taking over in India, ending the socialist run that the Gandhi clan had. Obviously, we've got Chairman Xi Jinping now. Abe's the clear Republican leader now in Japan. Poland right. willingly embraced Trump when he came over. Is Trump really just an indicator of a larger global trend and we're just the latest victim. Yeah. Mark, you've done some, some research, particularly on China, so. No, I, I, I'll pass on that, okay. really. It's the, no, but don't you come. Well, I, Good. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I actually think that's, uh, that's a fair characterization. I, I think there's a, uh, a wave of populism uh, around the world, and, and, and we've been caught up in it. And so uh, President Trump, is, is, I think, is just emblematic of something that's occurring uh, in many other places, particularly uh, uh, in, in Europe. And, uh, and of course, the Russians will be quick to uh, do the same thing there, take advantage of that, drive wedges internally in countries, uh, and as well as drive wedges between and among European countries and between Europe and us. And, and uh, th this general uh, resentment of uh, traditional government which is what we've seen here. This is the phenomenon, and this is what I think led to people to, to vote for Trump and to, and to support him, is this uh, frustration with uh, things here in, in, in this town and how, uh, in the minds of many people in flyover America, uh, you know, the, the Washington, D.C. is completely out of it and uh, not responsive to, to what their needs are. And he... He appealed to that, and that, and this is not the only, the only place that's happening. I, I, you know, I think Brexit, the Brits' withdrawal from the EU, same thing, is an aversion, uh, frustration in the UK, uh, to the traditional uh, government. I am uh, doing some research related to this. Um, I came across. I'll, I'll get the quote not quite right, but the substance is that elites in North America and in Europe feel more kinship with one another than they do with their own citizens in their own hinterlands. And that's been part of the issue. We have the last question here. Who's got it? Over here. Oh, there you go. Hi, good evening. My name is Craig Perry. I am the high school specialist for social studies here in Fairfax County Public Schools. I appreciate your insights about Russia's infiltration and creation of information. But isn't there a sentiment that the public should have been smarter or more educated about how to deal with that information. And if you have that You're sense, the social studies teacher. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So if you believe that sentiment, <laughs> what would your message be to current teachers teaching students for the future? Yeah. Well, there we go again. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, that was my point, right? That we have an important role to play, I think more important than ever. But it's really challenging for young people in the current environment to filter through the multiple sources of information out there. There's just a dizzying array of information sources, right? Um, and to be able to discern qualitatively what is accurate, what is not, what is you know, very reliable information, what is not, is extremely difficult to do. And uh, listen, American citizens are very busy on a day-to-day -day basis, and to be able to absorb so much information that's coming at them from so many different directions, and to be able to invest the amount of time and effort it takes to be able to discern intelligently what's reliable and what is not, takes a lot of work. Yeah. We're a demanding democracy. We expect our citizens to work really hard uh, for their citizenship rights and to exercise those responsibly, and it's getting harder uh, uh, because of all the things that we've been talking about tonight. Let me reinforce your, your point. Um, if you read the Federalist Papers, and these guys engineered something rather elegant, including the individual for whom the overall school is named for. Um, embedded in the Federalist Papers is a repeated reference to this only works with an informed citizenry. And, and absent that, it just, just doesn't perform. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the privilege of the chair and just let everyone have one, one final comment as we go by. Uh, I'll suggest perhaps a topic, but you don't have to take it. Um, so we've, we've, we've expressed a great deal of torque here, some, some high tension, some resiliency, some, some institutions standing up. Um, can there be a flashpoint? Is, is, there, is there a point that, that ignites something beyond what it is we're seeing now? And I just ask each from your own backgrounds, what is it out there that you fear would, would throw the switch and, and make this far more constitutional or a social crisis than, than it is? You mean domestic or foreign? Or Dem oh, actually, a foreign event could actually create. Well, I, I'll uh, start that by uh, saying I, I served in, uh, in Korea in the mid-'80s as a director of intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea, and I've followed the peninsula ever since, and uh, I got to go to North Korea in uh, November 14, uh, 2014, get two of our uh, citizens who were in hard labor out. And uh, I am very concerned about uh, the situation now, uh, mainly because of, of the uh, bellicose rhetoric that's being uh, exchanged. When I served there, I always wor the thing I worried about the most as a J2, or Director of Intelligence, was some small event in the demilitarized zone which went incendiary uh, immediately. President Trump, uh, say what you will about him, but he has some reasonable, temperate advisors, seasoned, wise counselors around him. Kim Jong-un does not. What he has is a bunch of psychophants, metal bedecked generals who follow him around and dutifully write down his every utterance. Nobody knows what Kim Jong-un's ignition point is. And I don't find this bellicose rhetor rhetoric very helpful and fine. I, in fact, I find it quite, quite bothersome given what's at stake. And if you contemplate for a moment, not to end this on a very heavy <laughs> note, but this would be cataclysmic if we got into something, uh, a, a nuclear exchange on the, on the peninsula. It would be terrible for the world and, and for this country. Nicole, flashpoint? I don't, I don't disagree, obviously, and, and the grimness of, of, of that scenario has been um, oft repeated um, you know, by folks like yourself on, on television, but this question I think that you're asking about is, 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 is there a tipping point? And I don't think there is. I mean, I think we're in this post-truth period where no matter what I say, no matter how many folks like yourselves I have as sources, 33% of the country won't believe any of it. 33% of the country will go to bed tonight not knowing that Bob Mueller indicted three people in the Trump orbit. 33% of the country would never believe that if anything happened on the Korean Peninsula, it had anything to do with anything Donald Trump did. And it might not. I mean, Kim Jong-un is a lunatic. Mm. But we are at a point where he's everything not. is... Well, he's, not, he's not suicidal. I um, mean, maybe homicidal. He's but rational. I mean, he's rational. But we are in a place where, you know, 
60 plus percent of the country thinks our president isn't rational, and 33 percent of the country will never believe that he's capable of, of, of really doing anything wrong. So I think we are, I think part of being post-truth is we are post-tipping point. I think that whole sort of paradigm for society and, you know, I, I've sort of on the George Packer unwinding. I think we've unwound, and I think in our unwound state, we are, it is impossible to tip us over. Okay. We've tipped. Right. Jack? So if I could just respond to the social scientists, then I'll, but let me answer the question first. Um, clearly a national security event is the thing that terrorist attack, something cataclysmic in North Korea, it could be anything. And the reason that is most worrisome is two. Those are the situations where the executive's power is enhanced naturally, and that may be a dangerous thing with this president, especially since the second point, that those are the times when you want someone with a steady hand and good judgment, and those are not qualities that the president has. To answer the question just briefly, I think that we should be trying to teach our young children to kids growing up to see all sides of an issue, force yourself to see perspectives that aren't yours, force yourself, train yourself to try to be empathetic to points of view that you don't share, because that's what we're losing. We're losing our empathy with citizens whose views we don't share, we're not talking to them, and I think we have to develop those habits of mind. I think it's very hard to do given the nature of the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Right. When you said flashpoint, I also thought North Korea. And one thing that really worries me about this president is that um, presidents, of course, will use rhetoric to appeal to domestic constituencies. There are clear political reasons for doing that. And sometimes that means using rhetoric that's a little bit overheated sounding uh, in order to ratchet up support. But responsible presidents have to be very cautious about how their views are interpreted outside the United States and what the implications uh, of those are. And this is where I really worry, and quite frankly, I'm a little bit scared about this administration because um, you know the Rocket Man and the other silliness, um, the you know the the bellicose rhetoric. Um, Sure, there are domestic constituencies who might find that a little bit amusing or you know, might be up, um, attracted to Trump because of some of his sort of strongman type rhetoric, but that's not how it's perceived in other contexts, and that's where the real danger is. And I think you know, uh, when, when you have these two men trading insults back and forth, right, as the leader of North Korea and the President of the United States has, um, who loses face, who reacts, um, you know, irrationally in response to an insult. That's what really worries me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we close, I, I want to thank Mark, who's been a driving engine behind not just this evening, but the whole concept of the center. Uh, Larry Pfeiffer, who's done yeoman work in putting this together. Uh, Judith Wildy, who has done everything possible to make this event possible tonight. Um, there are refreshments out in the hall. Conversations may continue. I uh, may invite you now to thank our panel for a very interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you.